chapter 6, applying the scriptures. God has given us his wonderful word. Incredible, powerful word. It transforms people's lives. And through the years, I must say, I've had such a joy and privilege of seeing that word do that very thing, including my own. And uh, there's nothing that compares to it, to its transforming power. This is not just mere words on a page of a book. It is God's eternal word. And uh, it's going to last longer than this all of creation. Jesus said, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It'll, have, it'll endure all of the library books and all of the world. And everything else has been written. God's eternal, powerful word. Now, what are the claims? We can look inside the Word of God, and we'll see what it states about itself. There in Hebrews chapter 12, one of my favorite verses, we're told, for the Word of God is living and powerful. In fact, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here the writer to the Hebrews is comparing God's Word to that of, a, say, a surgeon's scalpel. Now, the surgeon's scalpel can get into the body and get into all kinds of recesses, but we're told that the Word of God can go places that nothing else can penetrate. And what it does, it enters into the heart and begins to reveal to us the things that all of a sudden we realize should not be there. And so that's what the Word of God, it's this great cleansing agent of God. The Word of God, it will do that. If we, you'll really apply yourselves to God's Word, then it will be allowed to do its job and begin to clean us up. We're told in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14, this great prophet of old. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, he said to Jeremiah, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and his people would, and it shall devour them. Again, another aspect of the power of God's word. I've seen people actually plug up their ears so they wouldn't hear the word of God. Now, other things I'll listen to, but there's something about the Word of God that really offends people because it cuts across their lifestyle. Again, he would say to Jeremiah, Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Again, speaking about its power. But I love this fact. The seed is the Word of God. God likens his word to many things. And here, in Luke's Gospel, he says it is like seed. Well, that's kind of an interesting uh, description. How many of you have heard of the Russian thistle plant? Anybody ever heard of the Russian thistle plant? I heard of it, but I don't remember how it I know you've all seen it. But let me give you the history of it. Back in the 1850s, there was a group of immigrants that came out of Russia. They were Russian farmers, and they migrated to Minnesota. Now, in Russia, they were wheat farmers. And so, as they migrated to this country, they brought with them bags of wheat seed. And so, going <coughs> into Minnesota, they settled down and took that wheat seed and planted it. And along came these plants beginning to sprout. And as the wheat began to sprout in those fields, interspersed throughout this field were these Russian thistle plants that grew up to be they're good sized plants. It's interesting how these things are made because as they grow up, they're just they're just a mass of seeds. Thousands, perhaps, and even millions of seeds are just solid seeds. And as time goes on in the warm summers and so forth, the plants begin to dry out. And it goes all the way down to the base of the root, and it dries out. And because of the shape of the plants being round like this, they tend to pick up you know, the wind quite easily. And as the wind blows, the plant begins to rock back and forth. And because the base is drying out, it easily breaks. And what happens as it breaks, these plants being somewhat round, begin to tumble. And as they tumble, seeds just begin to fly off in every direction. I see them up and down like Lambert by the railroad tracks here. These big old plants tumbling down the way. You know what I'm talking about? Tumbleweeds. They're not native to this country. They came originally from Russia, end up in Minnesota, now they're all over the country. So that's what seed can do. And God says, you know, my word is like seed. 
And he would say there to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he who abundantly sows shall also reap abundantly. That makes absolute sense. The farmer that sows more seed is going to have the greater harvest, right? And so it tells to me that as believers, as Christians, as the church of Jesus Christ, if we take the word of God out into the world, the more that we give the word of God out, the greater the harvest, the spiritual harvest in time. And so it's, it's very clear to me that what God wants us to do is to take his word and disperse ourselves and just take the word everywhere. That's how the early church began. Pastor Jack on Sunday nights is now going through uh, the book of Acts. And you see that happening as the people just begin to scatter out of Jerusalem where it first began. And with them, they took their Bibles, the Word of God, and they begin to preach it and share it everywhere they went. And over the course of really that many years, the whole known world had heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. An amazing work of God's Spirit as the Word was taken out. So it's like seed. Again, Peter would write, we've all been born again, he said, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Now seed, when it's planted, initially comes up as a small little green stem or whatever. If you give it enough nourishment, water, and so forth in time, it'll become a sizable plant and hopefully become a useful plant. Well, it all begins with us as the word of God gets inside of us. It's, again, it's like seed. And it begins to take root and sprout. And as time goes on, that seed begins to grow as it changes our lives. And we become a fruitful product that the Lord can use. So again, the word of God is that seed. Our memory verse for tonight, how can a young man or a woman cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? And so again, it's the word of God that will cleanse our lives. Pastor Jack so often says, as he holds his Bible up, he says, you know, this book will keep you from sin, and, this, and sin will keep you from this book. The more we're in God's word, the more free we will be from sin. It's that powerful. It really is. I love that verse in Psalm 119, 165, where we're told, and great peace have those who love your law by taking heed of, I'm sorry, and nothing causes them to stumble. You want to have peace in your life? There's the key right there. The Word of God. Get your Bible out. Stay in it. Log as much time as you can in it. And you'll have great peace in your life. The trials will still be there. The storms will still come. And they'll be just as powerful as ever before, if not more powerful. But if you invest yourself into knowing God's Word and studying it and hiding it in your heart, those storms won't trouble you. They won't trouble you. I think one of the clearest illustrations of that is one night Jesus had his disciples and he said to them, let's get into the boat, let's cross over the sea, the Sea of Galilee. Well, these guys were pretty much veterans of that sea. After all, some of them were fishermen. They'd sailed that sea for years. And so they knew what they were doing. They were veteran fishermen and, and sailors as well. And so they get in the boat. Jesus said, well, you guys, let me know when we get the other side. I'm going to the back of the boat going to sleep. And he goes to the back of the boat and lays down on a pillow, sound asleep. And as they go across the lake, suddenly this huge windstorm comes up. A storm that has, was greater than anything that they had ever experienced before in their life. And suddenly these experienced veterans of that sea, who no doubt had experienced storms in the past, suddenly had met their match. In fact, something well beyond their match. To the point now, they're no longer screaming like men. They're screaming like women, hollering at the top of their voice. And they go back and they wake up, Jesus, don't you care, Lord? We're about to perish here. Now, where's he at? He's sound asleep in the back. Sound asleep. Waves going over, wind blowing, the boat's going like crazy. He's sound asleep in the back, like a little baby. And they have to wake him up. He says, don't you care? He says, oh, you little faith. Now, he had said earlier, we're crossing over to the other side. He didn't say, we're going to go under the other side. We're crossing over to the other side. <laughs> that was the destination. But suddenly they, they met the storm, and they forgot about the goal that he had set before. Them. Well, the word of God will produce that faith within us. He said, you know, Jesus said to these guys, oh, you have little faith. So how do we get faith? 
Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want more faith? There's the key right there. Get into God's Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So great peace it will bring to our lives. What are some of its exhortations? So many people today are convinced they, that they can live their lives apart from God. Or going to church, or even getting into the Bible. But Jesus said something as he quoted there from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When Jesus was tempted by the devil there in the wilderness, how did he defend himself against this awesome enemy? In every one of those temptations, he quoted the scriptures back to the devil. And over the course of time, after three trials, the devil left Jesus. He's an impatient devil. He gives up in time. But Jesus, how did he defend himself? He didn't get into an arguing match. He didn't voice his opinion. He quoted the scripture. And if Jesus, who is God, only quotes the scripture, how much more we need to know God's word? We need to know God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, there's two parts of our lives. There's the physical life, and we take generally pretty good care of it. We make sure it's well-fed, well-rested, whatever. But then there's the spiritual part, which is that eternal part. The physical part is temporary, but the spiritual part is eternal. So what should get the most care? Well, logically so, it would make sense to give the most care to our spiritual beings. And that's where the Word of God comes in. We stay in God's Word. We nourish that spiritual part of our life. When God looks at life, when He looks at us, that's what He's most interested in. That's what He sees, our spiritual life. That's why He sent Jesus to the cross, not to save these old sinful bodies, but to save our spiritual lives for all of eternity. And so that's where we need to concentrate our efforts as far as our daily nourishment is concerned. Our verse for this class, which you find there in the front of your book, says, As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, generally, I don't think, some of you have been mothers, I don't think you have to coax and beg a baby to eat. Right? I mean, it just, it's just the other way around. You eat or, in other words, they say, I'm going to eat or else, you know. I'll throw a big old temper tantrum right here. But I want to eat now. They have this incredible tenacity to want to eat when it's time to eat. They don't say, hey, you know, I'll adjust to your schedule no matter what. No, no way. God says in his word that he wants us in our growing relationship with him to have that same desire that newborn babies have for milk, that we might have that same desire for his word, that craving, that constant craving for his word so that we can grow. God says that his word will bring profit to our lives. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. How do we get our Bibles? The Holy Spirit wrote it through individuals. Some 40 authors over the course of many years wrote the word of God, the Holy Spirit. And as such, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We need to understand God's assembly manual. That's his doctrine teaching us to how we should live. Sometimes we need correction, reproof and correction, and the Word of God will do that. It will correct things that we perhaps shouldn't have said or certain things that we've done. So it's good for that. And instruction in righteousness. God has called us to live righteous lives before Him. How are we to do that? Again, we've got to have the instruction manual, and that's where the Bible comes in. So we can learn what God expects from us. Job went through a very long, prolonged trial. Probably one of the greatest trials that any man has ever suffered through. The interesting thing about this ancient sage, Job, and understand that he probably lived during the time of Abraham. In fact, as far as the book of Job is concerned, it could very well be the oldest book as far as writing is concerned in our Bible. 
because it would even precede the writing of Genesis, whom we assume was written by Moses, who lived much later than Job. So here's this man, a very righteous man, that goes through this incredible trial. And he's been given this amazing wisdom, this amazing perspective on what was happening. And he wrote, he said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips, God's lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I think so often when people go through really severe trials, the intensity of those trials becomes so overwhelming that the thought of just satisfying mere physical needs is so secondary. And that's what happened to Job. Suddenly he had a craving for the Word of God like never before. And just meeting his secondary needs, which was physical nourishment, uh, just seemed unimportant. David would write, or actually the psalmist in Psalm 119 would write, How sweet are your words to my taste. In fact, it's sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now, putting in the context of that historical time, <laughs> they didn't have the candy bars and all those kinds of things. There was no Godiva chocolates in those days. And to really have something special, you would go to the forest and you'd find yourself some honeycomb. That was the nature's candy store that God had provided. And so the psalmist now equates the greatest confectionery, honeycomb, <laughs> to God's word. And he says, you know, God's word is better than the best. It's better than the best candy there is. That's how much he craved and loved it. Jeremiah said, you know, I found your words and I ate them. And your word to me was joy and rejoicing in my heart. So as Jeremiah began to take in God's word, now keep in mind, if you've ever read the book of Jeremiah, you would understand the context of his day. He lived in a time when the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, was at its high point of wickedness. It had walked away from the Lord. There was idolatry everywhere. In fact, he had prophesied for over 40 years. And there's not any record in Scripture that he ever saw one convert. Now, this poor guy, he didn't have a church to go to. He couldn't have any fellowship with other believers. He was all alone, all by himself. And yet he remained faithful and steadfast over that 40-year ministry. So with all this going on around him, everyone hating him, trying to take his life, they tried to kill him. They threw him down into a pit, left him for dead. With all that going on, he said, I, took, I found the word of God, I ate them, and your word to me was joy and rejoicing in my heart. Which says to me that even in the midst of great adversity, God's word can bring comfort to our souls like nothing else. Bring joy to our hearts. And again, I point out there from the book of Matthew that when Jesus was tempted by the devil, and you see the illustrations there, the very examples, that every one of those temptations, Jesus responded back by just quoting the scriptures, quoting the scriptures, quoting the scriptures. What are some of the promises that God's word gives to us? Well, first of all, we're told that we must memorize it, which we've been talking about and stressing that Precious did a great job with tonight. We must memorize God's word. There's our memory verse for tonight. We're told by the psalmist, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's why we memorize it. Not only so that the Holy Spirit would have something to use, but his job is to keep us from sin. To point out uh, those potholes that are up ahead that seek to entrap us. So we need to memorize it. The psalmist would also say, this would be David's words, the law of his God is in his heart. Where are they? They're in his heart. As such, none of his steps shall slide. Without God's word, we're on slippery ground. Slippery ground. We're on thin ice. It's God's word that will give us that solid foundation. And that's why you're here tonight, because we, some would call this the foundations class. You see, the strength of the foundation will determine the longevity of the structure upon it. The stronger the foundation, the more it will wither the storms, earthquakes in this part of the country, certainly. And if we don't have that solid foundation of God's word, believe me, there will be an earthquake that will come along that will rattle you to your bones. That's all the more reason why we have to have God's word within us. 
Solomon would write to his son there in Proverbs, son in Proverbs chapter 2. He says, My son, if you receive my words and you treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as you would for silver and search for her as you would for hidden treasure, then, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If we take our Bibles and we just treasure them and value them more than any other perhaps tangible possession that we could possibly have. Oh, it will just transform our lives. It will rid us of fear and worry. But it will give us the amazing wisdom of God. The infinite wisdom of God. That's what God wants His Word to do in our lives. How so often take my Bible and I'll just hug it. <laughs> and I'll just tell the Lord, I love your word so much, Lord. And so often in the morning I'll be studying and I say, Lord, I don't want to put it down. i got to go to work, I know, but I want to put it down. It's so wonderful. It's like you precious. It's precious to me. Yes. Not only are we to memorize it, but we are to meditate upon it. We're told in Psalm 1, an apt opening to the book of Psalms. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. What's the result? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. I love these three verses. Because every time I read these three verses, a picture comes to mind that the Lord gave me many, many, many years ago. When my wife and I were newly married, we had a couple of kids that were really young. Uh, the only kind of vacation that we could really afford at the time was like a camping vacation, you know, with a tent and the whole thing. And so what we would do is we would go up into the Sierras. We'd go to a place which became a family favorite called Tuolumne Mills. It's the you know, Yosemite National Park, but up on the high country, so you'd go in from the east side. But my first time going up there, we'd, we'd always go up uh, the east side of the Sierras, up through Owens Valley, Highway 395, up to Bishop and so on. My first time up there and seeing this, an amazing sight. Have you ever been up there? How many of you got up that way, going through Owens Valley? No, come up yet. Well, if you drive up there, on the, on the west side, you have the Sierra Crest. I mean, these high mountains go like 14,000 feet, including Mount Whitney and all the others. Amazing scene. And you all generally obviously see snow up there and so on. You look in the other direction, it's desert. Desert. In some places, it looks like a volcano area with like lava everywhere. I mean, it just looks futurally awful, really barren, dry, hot. And of course, in the summertime, it gets pretty warm up there. But as you keep looking to the east, all of a sudden, you see all of these green trees snaking their way up that valley, that barren, hot valley. And so I looked at that and I thought, what in the world are those trees over there? Well, come to find out that that was the Owens River that flowed down the valley, you know. Came off the snow runoff of the Sears up north. Became, becomes the L.A. Aqueduct, you know, the water supply for L.A. And there's always water there. And because there's always water there, those trees are always very healthy and growing nearby that water supply because there's always water there. And regardless of how hot it gets in the summertime, those trees are just very happy, thank you very much. But you back away from that water supply a little ways and suddenly there's nothing but like sagebrush and you know, bird stuff. But close by, there's those green trees. Why? Because the water supply. So here the psalmist saying these words, and having been to Israel, you see some of the same picture over there because running along the eastern border of Israel is the Jordan River running out of the Sea of Galilee heading towards the south. Now that part of Israel is pretty much desert. On the east side of the Jordan, you're looking into Jordan, which is pretty much all desert. And even on the Israel side of the Jordan River, it's all desert going up to some mountains. But along the Jordan River, you have this green growth of trees all along up and down that river. Again, the water supply. So I'm thinking the psalmist, what that picture of mine says this, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. See, that's the desert part of life. You don't want to go there. Wrong friends, wrong relationships, wrong activities. The blessed man doesn't hang out there. 
What does he do? His delight is in God's law, the word of God, and in his law he meditates how often? Day and night. The water supply is always there, day and night, never runs out. And so he stays in God's word day and night, and as a result, he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, no matter how hot it is. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. Again, there's the guarantee again of what God's word will do. No matter what you do, you will prosper. As long as you stay in God's word, and this guy meditates day and night, and because he does, it doesn't matter how hot the trial is, no matter how hot the sun and noon day is, He's doing just fine, just like those trees. Beautiful picture. The psalmist would also say, you know, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You see, the word of God would turn the lights on. Because I know God's word, I can see all the stupid decisions that our government is making these days. And I can't figure out, why don't they understand? Why can't they see the handwriting on the wall? because they don't pay attention to God's word. We're pretty much getting rid of God's truth in our land. But if you pay attention to God's word and you hide it in your heart, believe me, the light's go on and you begin to see. Now we must routinely practice God's word. Why do we do that? Because as we do it, we show others our love for Jesus. Jesus said, he who does not love me does not keep my word. He who does not love me does not keep my word. Why aren't people reading their Bibles today? Because they don't have any love for the Lord. Our love for the Lord is our chief motivation for keeping his word. And if our love for Jesus begins to wane, believe me, our Bibles will begin to collect dust. Stop going to church because we've left our first love. I always say to people, you know, love is the greatest motivation of all. It's an amazing thing. It's a, it's a powerful motivation. You see, we can pretty much force almost anyone to do anything. If you hold a gun to a person's head and threaten them, they'll pretty much do it, but not willingly. They'll do it because they don't want to be, you know, shot at or whatever. But love, unconditional love, the love that comes from God, will put a person on their knees in full surrender and give them a heart to be willing to do almost anything to serve the Lord. Love is such a powerful, powerful thing. And if we love the Lord with all of our hearts, there's no price too great, no task too great that we couldn't do. Anything that the Lord would lay in front of us, we would be willing to do if we love him with all of our hearts. Love is a powerful motivation. He who does not love me does not keep my words. This is also a proof for our love for others. As God words, God's word gets into our lives, it changes us. And suddenly, we begin to be set free from the self-centered life of the past. And we'll begin to have a fixation on needs of others. And we'll be looking for ways to serve other people, to make their life better. That's the result of God's word. John would write in his little epistle, he said, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but also in deed and truth. One of the ministries I oversee here at Morning Star is called Servants' Quarters. Servants' Quarters. And the ministry, what it does basically is, well, it it's, has many functions. Right now, uh, the folks who are in this ministry, they're preparing meals for a family here at Morning Star who just recently had triplets, three little girls. Well, you can imagine, they had no kids before. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly they have three little babies. <laughs> and uh, they're very busy. <laughs> not Probably not getting a whole lot of sleep. So what we're doing over the course of a couple of weeks here, we're bringing meals into this family to kind of get them through this transition period. Another thing we're doing, we have a single woman who has to move on Saturday. And so we got some guys going out to help her move. And so what they do is they go out and find the needs of the body that arise from time to time and just help out. But it's all because they want to serve the Lord. They want to use the gifts that God has given them, albeit cooking or, you know, a strong back or whatever it is, to be able to serve others within the body of Christ, servants' quarters. By little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
No doubt you have noticed here at Morningstar that worship is a very important part of all of our services. And rightly so, because once God's word gets into our heart, it will give us a heart of worship. Once we begin to understand the great love that God has for us by sending his son to Jesus to die upon that cross and pay the price for our sins, to suffer that agonizing death, it will give us a heart to love the Lord and to worship him. And so Paul writing to the Corinthians would say, now let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. God's word. As it does, you will begin teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You see, once God's word gets in our hearts, worshiping him through music and our singing becomes automatic. It becomes an essential thing of our lives. We'll just want to do that. And so thus we do. Lastly, it's a demonstration of our witness. We're told you are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but is thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. Many years ago, my wife and my two kids, we were on an extended trip, and uh, we were going through the southern states one day. I remember I had to pull into this gas station to get gas. And this gas station, I can still picture this gas station. It was like an old-fashioned gas station. It was like a bungalow, kind of a building that was sitting catty corner in a corner. Long eaves, the old-fashioned gas pumps, which you never see anymore unless you go to some museum or something like that. But I pulled in here, and I saw the most unusual sight like I'd never seen before. Now, this was like a, a day in maybe April or May, something like that. But what I saw with this building with the long eaves hanging down from the eaves around this building were slabs of bacon and hams. Now, I venture to say you've never seen anything like this, right? And I, what in the world is this? Hams and bacons hanging off of the roof of this building. I don't know what this was. We went to a restaurant to have breakfast. And uh, they had a menu and looking over the menu and they had all these different choices, but there was like country ham, and sugar cured ham. And so I asked the waitress, I said, what's the difference between sugar cured ham and country ham? Well, I realized we were in the very deep south. In fact, we were in a different country because this woman with all of her two teeth tried to explain this to us, and we could not figure out what she said. I mean, she spoke a different language completely. And so I still didn't understand what the difference was. It was later on as we continued that trip, I finally understood the difference between these hams. You see, Back in the days before refrigeration in the country, the only way that they could keep meat without it spoiling was to just impregnate it with salt. Just pack as much salt as they could into it, because salt is a preservative. And if they got as much salt into it as they could, then they could keep this meat without having refrigeration, which they knew nothing about. Now, with that in mind, going back to our scripture here, where Jesus talks about salt, knowing that in his day there was also no refrigerators, no refrigeration. And so I'm trying to picture what life was like in those days. And so I put myself there in Jerusalem. And I've gone down to, say, the local market, which is an outdoor market, and I just maybe purchased a hind quarter of beef or whatever. So I've taken it home. I thought, well, i got enough beef here to keep me going for several months, but i got to somehow store it and preserve it. So I call up the Jerusalem Salt Company and I order out a camel load of salt. And so here they come out and they dump it on my driveway, right? And so I take this salt and I begin to just pack it into this meat just as much as I possibly can. And then wrap it up and take it downstairs to my little storm cellar and pack it away. Thinking, well, I'm set for the months to come now. Anytime I want a burger or a steak or something like that, down there, get it out, you know, soak the salt out of it, soak, soak the salt out of it, and just cook it. I'm, I'm, I'm there. But I'm sitting in my house one day, and I smell something that don't smell so good. So I go down, I fall my nose downstairs, and sure enough, there's that meat supply, and it, it's just putrid. And suddenly I realized I had ordered a bum load of salt. It's no good. My meat is spoiled. And so Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but salt, if it loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? As a result, it's neither good for anything but to be thrown out, trampled under the foot of men, so that in the wintertime, when there's snow or ice on the ground, it'll at least melt the ice. 
You see, salt is a preservative. That's, of course, it's a seasoning as well. But in those days, it was mainly valuable because it was a preservative. But if the salt is not good salt, it won't do its job. And as a result, decay will set in because <coughs> the natural process for anything is decay. And so it's important to be able to have something to prevent or at least restrain decay. Now, looking at in a moral application of this, as we look at our own land today, our own society, would you say that evil is growing or real, uh, evil is re receding? What would you say? Growing or receding? Growing. Well, I think that's pretty logical, isn't it? Now, Jesus said to the church, you are the salt of the earth. Now, if we have evil that is growing today and not receding, then whose fault is it? It has to be the salt, right? And we are the salt. We're not using the salt. We're not being that witness. And in bottom line, God wants us to be that witness of Jesus Christ, to take the word of God and take it out. So that lives could be transformed. You see, with all of these government actions today, and there's lots of causes, are there not? We have this kind of a demonstration and this kind of a demonstration, but you know what? No matter what you do in Congress or any kind of a legislature, you're not going to legislate evil away. All you can do is to keep coming up with more laws because more kinds of evil keep popping up, which you have to put band-aids on. The only way that society is can be changed is that the people change. Their hearts change. Until God is allowed to get into the recesses of a human heart, this land of ours will not change, no matter what this present president says. There will not be moral change until God is allowed to change the human heart. It'll just keep growing and popping up in new forms everywhere to the point where it'll be uncontrollable. And that's where we're at. Not only that, but we're told that we are also the light of the world. You see, this land is becoming all the more dark by the moment. Why? Because the light is going out. And the church, again, is the has the responsibility for the light. He says, a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they put a light, <clears throat> light a lamp and put it on a, under, a, under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I think one of the, one of the saddest things that is happening today is that Christians are compromising their walk with Jesus Christ. They're not living godly, biblical lives. They compromise. They take the part of God's word that fits their lifestyle and take everything else and throw it away and call themselves Christians. Jesus, in calling us to be his disciples, has called us to live a life whereby we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow him. That's not an easy thing to do. Denying ourselves is the hardest thing that we ever face because our greatest enemy is ourselves. If the church of Jesus Christ could once again become true followers of Jesus and live that sacrificial life, we would become once again that salt of the earth and the light of the world. And people should be able to see that difference in our lives, especially in this day and age in which we live. They should see this great contrast in our work ethic, how we work, our practices, our integrity. All of those things should be very recognizable because the world is going the other direction very, very fast. And so we have a priceless opportunity today to stand out in this world and to show that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives. It's the word of God that will transform our lives to the extent that the world will see that transformation and will experience the impact from it all. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight again, Lord, for your wonderful word. And oh, Father, if we could just invest ourselves in your word 
and allowed to have that full power and authority over our lives, oh, what a difference it would make. You've given your Holy Spirit to us, which we looked at earlier, and along with your word. And Lord, if we allow you to have your sovereign control, our families, those who are close to us, those with whom we work, maybe with school classmates, friends and neighbors, will see such an incredible difference that they'll be scratching their heads wondering why and how. Oh, Father, my prayer for all of these folks is that they will determine to follow Jesus no matter the cost. That they will sing that song most willingly, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And certainly, Father, you have given us a clear picture of what it is to follow your, your son, to go down that narrow road, through that narrow gate, denying ourselves, taking up that cross, and living that crucified life, death to self, death to the old life, but being fully alive with that new life you've come to give. May that be our supreme desire, to please you in all that we do, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Lord bless you.